first off, thanks to everyone who watched my video covering unused content in Zelda. It performed well enough that I plan to make it an ongoing series on the channel, meaning that there will be more videos on this topic that will come, this being part two. So without further ado, let's look at some more removed assets from your favorite Zelda games. Unused content is one of my favorite topics to discuss when it comes to video games because you get to take a look at what went on behind the scenes. Whether it be removed due to time constraints or just because the ideas didn't fit with the overall premise. While most of these concepts aren't left in the game's files, sometimes the developers forget to remove a few or decide to leave it in as a sort of gag. And the topic of removed or changed assets goes beyond what can be found in the game's files, since there's stuff such as beta footage. A game like Ocarina of Time is filled with unused concepts and ideas, while others don't have quite as much. One of these being The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Most of the unused files come from things which technically can be found in the game, it's just that hacks are needed to access these places. Those who enjoy shows such as Boundary Break know that you can find some pretty interesting things out of bounds. And thanks to user Weeztech, we are able to explore these areas. Skyward Sword has several chests, bird statues, and doors the player can never interact with. Two chests containing pieces of heart can be found outside of Karain's room and the Lumpy Pumpkin's main hall. Within Skyloft, close to the top of the bazaar, resides a goddess cube chest. There is no cube paired with this chest, however using a code to activate all goddess chests reveals its contents to be yet another piece of heart. Unfortunately, this is not enough to give Link an extra heart container. There is one more out of bounds chest found in the Fire Dragon Room's walls, and what's inside it will surprise you. It contains the Goddess Harp with no text displayed. This item is used by Princess Zelda throughout the game's story until she gives it to Link at the Temple of Time. It's possible that he was originally going to get it from a chest, perhaps as a reward for completing a dungeon, but that's just speculation. Three bird statues are located outside the sealed temple, Lake Floria, and sealed grounds. Going to the sky with these statues will give the player different results per location. The one within the sealed temple will send Link to Hylia's realm, while the bird statue at Lake Floria freezes the game. Around this area are two other out-of-bounds chests which hold a silver rupee and evil crystal. Attempting to go to the sky with the bird statue at the sealed grounds will transport the player to the flooded Faron Woods sequence of the game. Very strange indeed. Finally, two doors which are never used in-game are found in both the Sealed Temple and Hylia's Realm, the latter being the same area but in the past. One at the entrance to Faron Woods, in the spot the Sealed Temple's front entrance would be, and the other will be through a wall, behind one of the temple's small doors which reveals another door. Interacting with the one at the Sealed Temple transports the player to the Sealed Grounds, while the door at Hylia's Realm does something even stranger. It sends you to the same area, however there are changes to the game's audio. Link won't make any sounds, and whenever you land from a jump, a Bokoblin is heard screaming. I have no idea why this is a thing, but it's interesting nonetheless. Once again, thanks to Weeztech for the out of bounds codes, and his YouTube channel will be down in the description. One item exclusive to Skyward Sword is the Gust Bellows, located within the Lineru mining facility used to blow dust away to access more parts of the dungeon. Many of the game's NPCs can be blown by it, in which they'll react with a basic animation. One of these characters, Karain, has animations for this which are never seen in the game. By the time Link obtains the Gust Bellows, Karain remains indoors for the rest of the playthrough. The player can't use items when inside houses, therefore while this animation exists, it's never seen in game. In older builds, it's possible that the item was to be obtained earlier on, or that Karain used to be outdoors after receiving the Gust Bellows, or it's a generic animation that was added to all NPCs on the off chance it would be needed. One of the more interesting finds is this file named Blackstone. 
It's a model of an object that should look familiar since it somewhat resembles the ceiling spike, created by Hylia to imprison the, well, imprisoned. However, it's not as simple as a mere reskin of the ceiling spike. While the one in-game is triangular shaped, the black stone has a flat rectangular shape, and the edges of it are smooth all the way down in contrast to the ceiling spike, which does have some pointy edges. The patterns featured on both are also vastly different. Each face of the one in-game has one of the three goddess symbols, with the black stone donning the Triforce crest, each of them being differently styled triangles. I'm not too sure what this is supposed to mean, perhaps each one represents a piece of the Triforce. The symbols do look familiar, though I'm not sure where I've seen them. The three circles on each of them may represent the three different crests of the Golden Goddesses, since depictions of the Triforce are often paired with these symbols. Honestly, though, I have no idea what it's supposed to mean. What makes this discovery interesting is what's implied. You see, while characters refer to this object as the Ceiling Spike, its file is called Whitestone. Both the appearance and name compared to the Black Stone implies that it was a counterpart to the Ceiling Spike. What this would mean for the story, we'll never know. Before we continue to talk about unused content in Zelda, I just wanted to give a huge shout out to The Cutting Room Floor. Their whole website is dedicated to the research of unused content from video games, and it's my primary resource when it comes to making these episodes. If not for their hard work, these videos wouldn't be nearly as good. There's a lot of secrets within game files which, thanks to this website, are made easy to find. I'll have a link to their site in the description, and I highly recommend checking it out for yourself. When you compare its beta to the final build, Twilight Princess changed a lot. Whether it be new enemy designs or unused locations and concepts. One of the Nintendo Wii's biggest gimmicks at the time was the motion controls. A lot of developers would implement this into their games, though only a few of them did it well. Another feature of the Wiimote was its ability to play sound files. What the player heard depended on the actions performed in said game, like shooting star bits at enemies in Super Mario Galaxy, or the character selection screen of Super Smash Bros. Brawl. <coughs> Two of these Wii Remote sound files can be found in the game files of Twilight Princess, labeled as SPK Wave and Z2 SC Wave. The former contains sound files from Super Mario Galaxy, Here we go! It's important to know that, at the time of Twilight Princess's release, Super Mario Galaxy was in development. So it's not too crazy to believe that this game was used to test some of the sounds which would eventually be in Galaxy. It also explains why some of these sounds never appear in the final build of Super Mario Galaxy, as it was still in its development stages. And the other file, Z2 SC Wave, contains two unused sound clips of Navi. Watch out! Look! So perhaps Navi at some point was planned to be Link's companion, with Midna being a story-only character. One thing I completely forgot about when making this video was how the Wii Pointer from Twilight Princess is a fairy similar to Navi. This, along with the unused voice clips, could mean that at one time the player may have been able to point at enemies and activate a tattle feature similar to Ocarina of Time. Just an interesting thing to point out. The voice clips used are similar to the lines said by Navi in Ocarina of Time. It's possible the developers played around with the idea of Link's companion's voice coming from the controller and not the TV. It would make it much less annoying for players since they could simply mute the Wii Remote sounds and still listen to the game as they played. But let's talk a bit about the unused enemies. Many of their designs underwent drastic changes during development. In fact, there's so many of them that I'll only have time to cover a select bunch. The Temple of Time plays a much bigger role in this game as Link must travel back through time to explore it in hopes of finding one of the Mirror of Twilight shards. This dungeon is home to the Dominion Rod, which is used to navigate through the temple's many rooms, and to fight its boss, Armagoma. In the game's beta footage, there's a shot with a similar looking spider chasing Link down a narrow cave. Its design differs slightly, the placement of the eye resembling Goma. The thought of being chased through a confined space by a giant arachnid is both terrifying and kind of… exciting? I have no idea why this was removed since it would have made the boss a lot more interesting. 
perhaps a dungeon with sequences that force the player into running from this monstrosity, acting as a build-up for the eventual boss battle. It's a real shame that none of this is present in the final version of the game. One of the stranger enemies cut from the final build is a group of Gorons who, when approached by the player, morph into a golem and attack. It's possible to use codes and spawn this enemy in-game, however it can't harm you as there's no collision. Chances are it was scrapped very early in the game's development. It's not too crazy to believe that this was planned to be an enemy or mini-boss, as your first visit to Death Mountain reveals that the Gorons are preventing outsiders from entering. Link needs the Iron Boots to access the mountain, and many of the Gorons will attack the hero when approached. If the Goron Golem were to make an appearance, it would most likely be here. Another enemy within the game files is the Titan Armos. As the name suggests, it shares the color scheme and style of the Armos from the Temple of Time's dungeon. Either it was an earlier design for the Armos, with a slightly different name, or both of them were planned to appear in the game as separate enemies. I think the latter is more likely since the animations of the Titan Armos are completely different compared to the ones from the Temple of Time. One of the more terrifying unused enemies is this one, what could be an earlier version of the Shadow Beasts. Footage of them exists in the earlier Twilight Princess trailers, and the movements are similar to the Shadow Beasts in the final build. I think what makes this creature so terrifying is the elongated arms and lack of a proper face. It gives off a bit of a Slenderman feel. There's a lot more when it comes to changed enemy designs, so if you want to see me go over more of them, then feel free to let me know in the comments section. You'd be surprised with just how much unused text these games have. At times it's tempting to just ignore this section given how long it takes to go over, especially since the majority of it doesn't contain anything that interesting. One of the more hilarious discoveries is this text, which, when translated, is testing out the text on signs. It reads, This is a stone sign. A sign. It has five lines. It can fit five lines on it. It can fit one more line. This is all that fits. There's one chunk of removed text which shows that, at one time, the Twilight could speak to the hero when visiting the Twilight Realm. They don't necessarily give us new information, but it does expand on the story by adding some context. It's interesting to hear their point of view, mentioning how Link must be the hero the princess sent, the betrayal of Xant, and the Black Fog which stole the sparkle from this land. In the final version, Link is unable to talk to the Twilight. As someone who enjoys making theories and diving into the lore of Zelda, it's kind of a shame that this was cut from the game. One mechanic that Twilight Princess borrows from other Zelda games is the making of potions through Chew Jelly. This concept was introduced in Wind Waker, where the player can exchange different types for different potions. The Red Jelly making Red Potion, which restores your hearts, the Green Potion used to refill Link's magic meter, and the Blue Potion, which restores both your hearts and magic. The Chew Jelly from Twilight Princess operates in a similar way, allowing the player to scoop up the substance in a bottle to drink. Other varieties of chews were added, such as yellow and purple. But there are two other types of jelly worth talking about. Black Chew Jelly, an unused item which would have most likely come from a black chew, which is also never found in the game, and Green Chew Jelly. Now, technically, you can't find this variant of Chew in the game. However, when in the Cave of Ordeals, it's possible to merge a blue and yellow, which creates a green Chew. Killing it and scooping up its remains will give Link the green jelly. No text is present when obtaining this item in the Wii and GameCube versions, and while the player can drink it, it does absolutely nothing. Since Wind Waker's green potion was used to restore magic, chances are that was the purpose of it in Twilight Princess. This all ties into another scrapped concept of the game, the magic meter. The removal of that made the potion essentially useless. And it's exactly why Link can't find any green shoes in the overworld. Though thanks to this one room in the Cave of Ordeals, it's still possible to get this item in the game. And instead of removing it in the HG version, Nintendo added this bit of text as a sort of joke as the item has no real use. It's interesting because, given what we know, the magic meter was scrapped very late in development. I have a copy of the game for the Nintendo Wii, and you can see the magic bar in one of the screenshots. 
It's really not that surprising though, since we have the magic armor that for some reason runs on rupees. There's a theory that a rupee's value comes from its potency in magic, though it's pretty clear that the armor was originally going to be powered by magic. Another item found in the game is the fire arrow, and given its function in past games, would have also needed magic to use. And some of the game's unused text proves that Link would have needed magic in order to transform into his wolf form. Twilight Princess has even more unused assets, so chances are I'll return to this game in another episode. One game we talked about last time that I'll be returning to for this video is Ocarina of Time. Out of all Zelda games, this one underwent the most change and is filled with scrapped concepts and changed details. And this makes sense since this was Nintendo's first attempt at a 3D Zelda game. In beta footage, Link's design was vastly different compared to what we see in the final build. It's very similar to the look of A Link to the Past's hero. Perhaps this was before they decided on having the player travel through time, as adding that mechanic forced them to design two variants of the Hero of Time, as both a child and adult. It explains why the trailer shows Link obtaining the Triforce, despite it contradicting the game's lore. The developers were still working out the story and reworked the game to fit this narrative. Castletown itself underwent massive changes throughout development. Beta screenshots show a fully rendered 3D town that the player could walk through. It's much bigger compared to the one in the final version, with most of the town composed of 2D images. It makes sense that Nintendo scaled this down since the one from the images looks kind of empty. By cramming it into a smaller space, it feels like there's more to do. Though I'm not sure why they used flat images instead of full-on 3D renders for the buildings. Perhaps it's a hardware limitation sort of thing, but that's speculation. I did find some interesting things in the game's removed text. When it comes to Zelda, the developers aren't afraid to add the occasional dark bits to their games. Redeads, the Shadow Temple, and basically all of Majora's Mask. But Ocarina of Time has one detail which is unnoticed by many. Once Link collects all the spiritual stones and heads back to Castletown, he witnesses Ganondorf pursuing Impa and Princess Zelda. If the player goes into the back alley before grabbing the Master Sword, you'll see a collapsed guard. If talked to, he'll mention the Gerudo King's betrayal and instruct Link to go to the Temple of Time. After this, the soldier spazzes out for a brief moment and stops moving. If talked to again, Navi states that he's not moving anymore. It's implied that the guard passes away shortly after talking to Link. Some people believe that he simply went unconscious and passed out. However, some removed text mentions him no longer breathing, meaning that the soldier did indeed die. It's details like this which add to the overall experience and make the situation all the more tragic. I made a whole theory on this topic, and the link to that will be down below. But let's talk about one of the funnier discoveries made when skimming through the game's removed text. There's one point in the game where the Hero of Time travels through the desert to the Spirit Temple. Outside the dungeon is a massive statue referred to as the Desert Colossus. A similar structure is also seen inside the temple itself. If Link targets the face and uses Navi's tattle ability, she mentions a face looking evil. One bit of removed text from the game, with the ID 011F, says the following. Link, what are you staring at? This dialogue is right before message 0124, which is the comment of the Desert Colossus's evil looking face. Given the removed line's positioning, and the fact that the statue's nipples are targetable, implies that this dialogue might have been triggered if Link stared too long at the statue's... uh... Jigglypuffs. It's definitely one of my favorite discoveries when making these videos, and just goes to prove that it's worth reading through the game's removed text. On February 4th of 1998, beta screenshots of Ocarina of Time were made public. A handful of these were of a location never seen in the final game. A room resembling the Great Fairy Fountains, with three statues of unicorns in the middle. This location was later teased in March, in the 106th issue of Nintendo Power. Players have dubbed this the Unicorn Fountain, with speculation on what its purpose was. One possibility is that it was an early design of the Fairy Fountains. As a matter of fact, Ocarina of Time's Great Fairies used to look very different, with a crystalline appearance, similar to Wind Waker's, and the model used for this design is the same as the in-game Great Fairy. Many speculate that the entrance to this fountain was planned to be within Zora's domain, under the water. There's a gap within the part of the rock which could have been an entrance to this location, 
but it's impossible to reach this in-game unless the player uses hacks or glitches. Link as a child is unable to use the Iron Boots, and in the future, the water is frozen solid. Though, if a player does manage to get down here, they're met with a solid wall. But at one time, this may have served as an entrance into the fountain, which was later removed. According to the wiki, this location was supposed to appear in the unreleased Yura Zelda for the Nintendo 64 disk drive. It's said that the area was planned to contain the Triforce, and be where Link learnt the Sword Beam attack. I'm not sure how credible this information is, I couldn't find any interviews or articles which reported the fountain being a part of the Ocarina of Time expansion. When researching this video, I do recall coming across information that remnants of the Unicorn Fountain were found in the game's code. Neither could I find sources of this place being the resting place of the Triforce, nor where the player would learn the Sword Beam attack. Those sound more like rumors which quickly spread and gained popularity. It makes no sense for the Unicorn Fountain to hold the Triforce, as it contradicts the series lore. I do believe the theory that Link was going to learn the Sword Beam attack, since that's not present in the final build, which would explain the Fountain's removal from the game. I wish there was more information on the scrap location, because it's one of the more interesting things from Ocarina of Time's beta. Though, as stated before, it might have simply been an early design for the Great Fairy Fountains. Thanks for watching another episode of Unused Content in Zelda. Make sure to hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed and want to see more of the series, and let me know what games you want to see covered in Episode 3. As of now, I've only talked about the 3D games, mainly because they tend to have the most unused content, but I'm open to suggestions of other titles. Whether they're requested or not, I'm sure I'll get to them someday. Links to Twitter and Discord are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.